Good morning and welcome to the bicennial edition of the City and County of Denver's GIS Day. That's right, 20 years. We'll be giving Doug Genzer a set of porcelain plates at the happy hour tonight uh, as is tradition. Uh, I'll be your host, Andrew Blunk. Um, today this also happens to be my wedding anniversary, so for those of you hoping to catch a glimpse of my bullet, uh, it's obviously been removed, which may have something to do with these two momentous events culminating today. Uh, Bruce Reagan will be assisting with the moderated Q&A with, today with me. Uh, we have a really great program for you today. Uh, real world examples of how GIS works for the city and county of Denver. We will have seven presentations and we will please ask that you ask your questions via the live event Q&A tab in Teams. So as the presentations are going on, if you have any questions, just drop them into that Q&A chat. And then once the um, presentation is over, uh, we'll give the presenter a chance to answer your questions. Uh, we'll also be giving away five ArcGIS for personal use licenses um, in between presentations. So uh, Bruce will be asking you a question about that previous presentation. So you got to pay attention. And the first person to answer the question correctly in the chat uh, we'll be uh, throwing a ArcGIS for personal use license to you. So to get our presentation, our GIS day kickoff started, um, we have a uh, Dave Edinger, the CIO, um, Chief Information Officer of Technology Services in the City County of Denver, is going to be presenting um, this on this application, uh, the COVID-19 vaccine support dashboard. Uh, which was used by the city's emergency operations center and the denver department of public health and environment to um, help roll out the city's effort in um, getting uh, equitable dis uh, equitable distribution of the COVID vaccine so uh, without further ado i hand it over to dave editor thank you andrew and um happy uh, happy anniversary i didn't know it was your anniversary Seems like old times though, back here on virtual GIS day. Um, this is the 20th anniversary of GIS day, believe it or not, and our second, if I'm counting correctly, virtual GIS day. Go ahead and in the chat, put where you were living in 2001 on our first GIS day. I just went ahead and posted mine so you'd see how that's done. Um, and if you were not yet born, you can use the acronym NYB to put that in there or just say not yet born uh, in the chat so we all can practice using that. Um, this is, as I mentioned, the second year we've been virtual um, and uh, we have lightning rounds of presentations of all the great work that's been done over the last year uh, following this one. But I, as, as Andrew said, are kicking this off um, to talk about something that we think about almost every day, which is COVID. And specifically, how is the city doing at mitigating its uh, the, the impact of COVID so we can all lead healthy, active, fun lifestyles and get back to some semblance of normal. The COVID vaccination dashboard uh, has been key to this. That's what Andrew is showing now um, and how we've been implementing our strategies through the Denver Department of Public Health and Environment uh, to vaccinate the hard to reach populations in Denver. And as we all know, um, at first there was more demand for the vaccinations than supply and the vaccinations were parceled out based on criteria, think age criteria, that type of thing. Uh, after um, a short time though, uh, the demand was met and we had to turn as a city and as a region to those who were not yet vaccinated. And what came into play were mobile vaccination units that could meet people where they're located. So we had to understand where the greatest need was located and where we could mobilize those units and that's what the map here is showing the green um, uh, icons are the places where we've had mobile units in um, in Denver and each neighborhood is color coded based upon the current vaccination percentage that's one of the drivers that we use to understand where to put these mobile units and we see the familiar what we call a lot of us in the city called the familiar inverted L pattern sort of up Federal Boulevard and then west across I-70 or sorry east across I-70. Um, uh, it's making that sort of inverted L pattern that we see in a lot of the things that we map for the city. 
Um, the, you know, it's important to point out that exceptions exist to that pattern. For example, Central Park neighborhood in Northeast Denver has high vaccination rates. And in Southeast Denver, where we generally have high, we have lower rates in the Goldsmith and Kennedy neighborhoods. Um, and we would, uh, we can send a unit out to these neighborhoods for the first doses, record that, and then follow up for the second dose in the same location three to four weeks later. So far, DDPHE, the Denver Department of Public Health and Environment's mobile vaccination teams have made 337 visits to 127 unique locations across the city. They've administered 14,600 doses to 8,600 residents, many of whom might not otherwise have received a vaccination. Um, GIS informed that decision making and results. Um, it was kind of interesting. At first, the, the mobile units went to the assisted living locations where the primary barrier to being vaccinated was mobility and focused on um, that 65 plus age group. The percentage of white non-Hispanics that were vaccinated in that initial round was pretty high because that's generally the makeup of those uh, assisted living type facilities. So um, we saw at first that that number of white non-Hispanic, the white population, go re be a really high percentage of who was being vaccinated through the mobile vaccination units. But pretty quickly thereafter, the neighborhoods that were harder to reach for other reasons, like cultural reasons, lack of access to traditional medical care, et cetera, those populations started to factor in. And you, we saw that, that percentage of the white population being vaccinated through the mobile clinics drop pretty quickly. And it's now down at around 43% of the total, meaning the majority of folks are um, people of color. So that, that in and of itself was an interesting metric to watch as we use the data to drive where we put the mobile um, clinics. The other thing that I found interesting in this is that DDPHE really did a good job of partnering with the local trusted neighborhood organizations to deliver the message in, messaging, often in the language of the people who live there, uh, to get people to come out to the mobile units and become vaccinated. So all of that was a really interesting story. There's so much more to uncover here. Um, and this dashboard, hopefully we'll be able to make it available um, to everybody, but it's just a really interesting to look at some of the underlying data and the trends that occurred over time. So um, of course we have some new challenges coming out with COVID. This is gonna be with us for a while. A couple of those are the new five to 11 age group that is now, um, able to be vaccinated. So I imagine we'll be using these same maps and data to target elementary school locations and craft the right messaging to get that population vaccinated. And then of course we have booster shots, which um, you know, are experiencing a, a, a sort of a COVID fatigue type of problem. Uh, people are just kind of sick of this stuff. I just got off the phone with a, a former colleague at, at, at City and County of Denver who was saying, yeah, I got vaccinated, but I'm not so sure I'm gonna get the booster. I don't know that that's, you know, I think it's going to be a whole different type of uh, challenge to make this a long haul type of, that's probably poor choice of words, long term type of um, uh, of effort and how we use data and GIS to do that will be important. Overall, Denver is outperforming the rest of Colorado, both in terms of the vaccination vaccination rate. We're at 69 percent in, in Denver versus 62 percent statewide. Also on some of the other metrics we care about, like the case rate, we're at 39 per 100,000 versus 52 at the state level. Hospitalization rate is lower, 21 versus 27. And the death rate is lower, 0.22 versus 0.48 in Colorado. So pretty much on every measure, Denver is outperforming uh, the state. And I think we should all be uh, really proud of the work that DDPHE has led and that others have participated in to make Denver a shining star in the state. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Andrew. Thanks, Dave. All right. Bruce, do we have any questions? I don't see any. Oh, someone asked if this is being recorded, and yes, it is. Just throw that out there. All right. Do you have we do have a lot of people who uh, from Denver and Lakewood who were in, in that place, but then we have a lot from uh, around the country. Great, good to see a good turnout this year. 
All right, if we don't have any questions for Dave, we will go ahead and keep it rolling to our next presenter. Um, up next, we have Grant Garska from the Community Planning and Development uh, Department from the City and County of Denver, and he will be presenting his uh, presentation on using 3D web scenes and building hype for planning. So um, I'm gonna kick it over to you, Grant. All right, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming to GIS Day. So I am going um, to present on a tool that uh, we kind of spun up quickly to do some analysis as part of the West Area MPI plan. And the real goal of this plan, I guess, was kind of, uh, well, not the plan, but this application was threefold. One is we wanted to kind of show what is the baseline current scenario of building heights in the West Area. Second, um, you might recall a few years back, the Blueprint Denver plan, which was the citywide plan, was passed, and that made some recommendations about building height across the city, uh, but we're focusing on this uh, West Denver area. And third is currently active is the West MPI area, and part of the planning process is kind of be in conversation with that Blueprint data and maybe come back and refine some of that data and make additional recommendations or changes or adjustments to what Blueprint had said based off of kind of a more localized understanding and context that that plan is able to do because it's working in that neighborhood. So those are kind of the, the three scenarios we're gonna walk through kind of quickly here today. Um, a few things before we get into it, uh, I do wanna say kind of there's some major assumptions in this. Uh, this was meant to be kind of that quick model to illustrate what's happening on the ground and maybe what we're proposing. There's probably a lot more we could do in terms of, um, you know, building 3D buildings that look like what's on the ground or trying to be a bit more precise with our buildings. But that wasn't really the goal of this project. We were kind of looking for how how can we get the point across of of evaluating different height scenarios in this area. So that's what we're going to look at today. So first, uh, you should see an Arc Pro session open and I'm using scenes. The important thing, if you've never really used a scene in Arc Pro before is, um, it, it's kind of the driver is having this elevation uh, layer in here. It doesn't have to be on, but that's what kind of drives the, the 3D data in your map. So first, you know, we can come in here and this is just uh, using our building height data. Um, you can get this on our open data catalog. I did some additional processing in it just to kind of uh, merge these features based off of the max height per building. So if you got the building layer off open data catalog, it actually will have um, some more variation on the building. But again, we're just kind of looking at the data in general. Um, so just give an idea of what kind of the current conditions on the ground are um, you know, today with with buildings in this area. I can zoom out a little bit and show you. We're working along uh, Lakewood Dry Gulch uh, on West Denver here. You can see Sloan's Lake there at the top. But really, we're not even uh, going to use these buildings. Uh, what we're really using is our parcel data. And we, at first, for that existing conditions analysis, we looked at the um, zoning that's on the ground and said, OK, well, based off of this zoning code, how high does that allow for buildings to be built? And again, uh, you can see we're using kind of this bulk model. You could say it's kind of generic, or maybe we dumbed it down a bit, but I like to call it a model. Um, it's not exact uh, for two reasons. Um, one is not all zoning code defines the height. Um, some are kind of based off of a floor area ratio that might determine how high a building is or something like that. So we made just kind of a general assumption and we're going to carry this assumption through all the different data layers that I show you today is that, uh, you know, something that allows one story, we're going to say it's 10 feet tall. And that's what we're kind of putting out there to illustrate our point of these different scenarios. So we looked at all the zoning code and I can kind of uh, open this up for you and just give you an idea of what we did. You know, so we we joined our parcels with our zoning data to get you know the zoning values we needed in here. We kind of you know went through each type of zone that's in the west area and figured out okay, well that allows this 
type of uh, or this amount of stories for that zone. And again, some of these we kind of you know made a judgment call of what might just work best in that area. And then we made that general assumption of times in it by 10 feet. So we got our height value for this data and then we're able to extrude that data into the 3D map. So coming along then, we wanted to look at our blueprint data. What this allows us to do is kind of compare and contrast what the current baseline scenario is with what Blueprint Denver was proposing happen along this area. So you can see there's quite a bit difference in some areas. Some of it is um, due to this is along public transportation. We have the light rail coming through here. And uh, it extends back kind of from there in the stair step away from the gulch and the park and the, and the transit stations of what's happening. Now the west area plan came through and said, well, maybe, you know, this isn't always the best case, but how do we show people, you know, what we really want to propose in this area? So we came through with the same data set again and defined building height recommendations for the West Area Plan. And we can draw that data on top of this data as well. So what this allows us to do is very easily and in an interactive manner, come in here and you know play around with the data see it from different perspectives get on the ground and actually compare different building height uh, scenarios so you can see you know on this kind of block here see current conditions the west proposal which is a refinement from the initial blueprint um, data evaluation so i mean nothing uh, too crazy but it gives a quick look into you know what this plan is proposing if we were just to look at this data you know from map um, you know straight down on top you don't really get that same effect of oh you know this blue is representing something a lot higher than what's there now or what uh, is being proposed or refined and i wanted to uh, show you a little trick to really make this work if i zoom in kind of on a corner here you'll see that these buildings are kind of nested within each other. The reason we did this is because if, if we just use the same extent for all of this data, when I turn on each one of these scenarios, it would basically absorb the previous data and you wouldn't be able to actually see, you know, uh, that kind of hand in hand comparison between the three different data layers. So what I did to pull that off is these are all basically just you know, this is the same starting point of our parcel layer. And I did a negative buffer by one foot on the west area layer to kind of shrink all that data in. And then I did a negative buffer on the blueprint data to by a negative two feet to shrink that in just a touch more. So that allows us to see all three of these scenarios at the same time in this fashion. Then once we had the data set up how we wanted, we had it symbolized by our different, you know, assumed feet heights. What we then did is we took our scene, we could publish this out as a web scene to our ArcGIS Online account, which basically puts all of this data in a lightweight web application that allows us to do the same thing. This doesn't require, this is publicly available, so it doesn't require any you know, software or licensing uh, beyond what the city already owns. And we can come in here and you know, maybe road show this information or show it to different committees and put it out there publicly for people to interact with the data so they can you know, see in their own neighborhood what's happening, what's being proposed, how these proposals of different scenarios might affect people living in the area and what all the data looks like. Again, we're not, there are, you know, this data would look very different if we looked at the building shapes themselves. We have to consider building setbacks that are within each zoning code, bulk plane data, and uh, potentially the lot coverage of a building. But again, we just wanted to kind of a quick overview of, you know, how can we use this data to quickly show what's going on in this area? And one thing I really like about this uh, web tool, it's really easy to also come in here. We could pick uh, today's date. 
uh, November 18th. And we can take a look at later today how the shadows will be cast based off of these different scenarios in the layer, which is pretty cool because you can really get a sense of how far um, these different scenarios would have that shadow effect on the ground. Again, this, this is kind of generic data, but it gives that general sense of um, what's happening. Uh, so with that, um, I guess the two kind of key takeaways I want to leave you with is if you want to do something like this, you need to um, build out your data in Arc Pro, uh, get everything set up how you like it and publish that out to a scene, a web scene, so you can build uh, a quick web app like this. And uh, the second little trick was really doing the negative buffers on your different scenarios to see all the data at the same time. Uh, I will say that there's probably some additional tools out there today, such as ArcGIS Urban, that do some 3D modeling like this. You could do some on the fly um, uh, metrics and dashboarding that come with that tool. At the time we built this out, we didn't have an ArcGIS Urban license, so we didn't do that. We have that now. Uh, we just haven't had time to spin that up in this fashion. Um, and let me see what else. And you know we we could have spent more time, you know, actually building 3D buildings and modeling the data that way. But that that didn't really accomplish the goal of just, hey, in general, here are the scenarios we're evaluating, and this is a quick way we can show off that data. Uh, so with that, uh, let me know if there's any questions, and I'll throw it back to the team. Yeah, I think uh, Bruce. It looks like we got a question in there. Yeah. So uh, Anonymous asks, uh, did you attempt to put this building data on the LiDAR service surface? Uh, I have not worked much with LiDAR uh, personally. So uh, right. I know we have some new li LiDAR coming online here soon, um, but that's not really data I've worked with too much. Yeah, and if you did that, would you get like the, the turrets and all that stuff for the county building and thing a little more fancy? Yeah, we, yeah, we probably would. Um, I guess I'd have to play around too then with extruding that to these different scenarios. I don't know. Yeah. I guess m multiplying those those floating points to a new spot or something like that. And we have another comment that says, "Really cool, Grant. I like how you fake the cartography a little to be able to see the buildings in Broncos colors." <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, Grant. I thought that I thought that was genius uh, doing the negative buffer <coughs> to nest those. I was wondering how you were doing that that whole time, so uh, that's really cool. Mm -hmm. um, all right, I don't think we have any other questions, but oh, Bruce, wait, wait. We, oh. we do have one more question. Um, oh yeah, how does how does CCD plan to leverage Urban? Uh, just a few months ago, we got that license to start using it. So, I mean, first we need to kind of uh, test it and see the application of it and how we can best use it. Uh, I think it does have some great benefits. Uh, there's a kind of an initial build out of Urban, at least that's my understanding. So we need to get kind of our zoning code in there. Uh, so we're probably not going to use it you know, citywide. We're going to pick out some key areas or some currently active plans and uh, get that zoning data and building data in there so we can evaluate the software at kind of site by site level. And then from there, if it's successful, we can branch out. Cool. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, definitely a cool new tool that uh, CPD has been looking into. All right, I think Bruce is now going to propose or uh, give out a question on Grant's presentation to see who is paying attention. OK, and the question is, and I've posted it in the Q&A, when working with 3D data in ArcGIS Pro, what is the name of the file type you upload to ArcGIS Online? And the first correct answer that I receive, um, well, will uh, be the winner. And that is a um, RTS online for personal use license that we will be giving out to the first correct answer. All right, so as people are dropping in their answers, we're going to move on to our next presentation. Um, we have a few presenters on this one. We have uh, Kathy Zarin, Doug Genzer, and Steve Sharp are going to be presenting on uh, GIS and City Council redistricting. So I'm going to hand it over to you. Good morning, everybody. 
so this is going to be a little bit longer than the other lightning talks, not quite lightning because uh, we have three presenters from two different agencies, but it's an important topic and a great demonstration of the way GIS can su support our democratic processes. So I'm just going to give an overview on city council redistricting and re-precincting. Then Steve Sharp of the Denver Election Division is going to talk about the whole re-precincting process. And then Kathy Zern will uh, talk about uh, the redistricting analysis for city council we've done and give a sneak demo, sneak peek demo of the uh, software that city council and the public will be able to use to submit new redistricting maps. So what is redistricting and what is re-precincting? So every 10 years with the release of the new census data, we redraw city, um, city election precincts using registered uh, active registered voter counts and the census block data from the census. And those are the building blocks that will be used to build uh, new city council districts. So city council districts are built from the election precincts and they look at population, demographics, uh, areas, um, the different, different equity indicators, neighborhoods, and uh, communities of interest uh, for their, their, to create their maps. So it's required uh, every 10 years under the city charter. And the, the bottom line is to come up with 11 city council districts with roughly equal population. So there's a bunch of players in this process. Uh, I work for technology services, as does Kathy, and we downloaded the census data. We made it more accurate to match the, the city's base layers. We'll provide GIS analysis and mapping, and Kathy will show you some of that in a minute. Uh, we're gonna set up this uh, web-based software for the public and city council to use. The state just completed their redistricting process, which was a prerequisite because we need to respect their boundaries with the boundaries that we, we build. And um, so that was for the State House, State Senate of Colorado and uh, the con state, uh, state congressional districts. Uh, the election division will handle the re-precincting and Steve is gonna talk about that. Uh, the city council redistricting committee will do public outreach and they'll use this uh, web-based software to create new proposed maps and they'll, they'll vote on a final map. And the public will also be able to use the software to create maps and have their voices heard. They'll also be invited to participate in public meetings. So a little bit about political geography and geography of the census for the city and county of Denver. This map shows uh, City Council District 1, or at least most of it. So Denver City Council districts are made up of whole election precincts. So these orange lines are the current election precincts and the red outline is the current City Council district. Election precincts are made up of whole census blocks. So these gray lines, which are about a city block in size, they're the smallest census geography and they have uh, population and demographic data. So all that data gets aggregated up to the census block, I'm sorry, to the election precincts. And then these election precincts are chosen to come up with 11 roughly equal in population uh, uh, city council districts when the process is done. So now Steve Sharp is going to talk about the re-precincting process. Steve? Excellent. Thank you, Doug. Yes, my name is Steve Sharp. I am the senior GIS analyst for the Denver Elections Division, and I'll be kind of going into greater detail of how re-precincting fits within the overall redistricting process. So to begin, before any entities can create their uh, new districts, uh, next slide, please. Uh, we, as Doug mentioned, we kind of have to rely first on the state creating their new congressional and legislative boundaries. So what happens first? Here we have an image of uh, all 140,000 plus <coughs> census blocks across the state of Colorado. There are newly created Colorado independent redistricting commissions working on all of these state boundaries. They use this 2020 census geography and the population and demographic data contained within to create their districts. 
from these census blocks, they will combine them together. Uh, and then we can click through a few slides here. We see as they balance the populations, they created eight new congressional districts. On top of that, they built 35 new Senate districts. And lastly, there were 65 state house districts. We can kind of see statewide how they all overlap. Doug, I believe, mentioned in his previous slide that they just this past Monday, the Supreme Court of Colorado approved all of their plans. So we now know what those boundaries officially look like. To take a step back in time, while the state was working on creating their new boundaries at the county level here in Denver, we begin kind of prepping for creating the new election precincts. We too, as Doug mentioned, use the census block geographies as our smallest building block, but we're under slightly different rules. And when we are concerned about building election precincts, the populations within those is based on the active voter register count, not the census population. So to prepare for re-precincting, we had to uh, assign the information to each census block of the voter counts of each active registered voter. So here in Denver, you can see we have over 10,000 census blocks. We assign the active voter count to each of those blocks. From there, on top of that, we overlaid, uh, we can go to the next slide, all of the statewide boundaries that were created and recently approved. This generates for us what we consider hard boundaries, you know, the congressional house and Senate lines, our lines that legally we cannot have the precincts cross. They have to be fully contained within these areas. So overlaying these together, we create these kind of unique district areas. On top of that, we also have to take into consideration what we call soft boundaries. These are boundaries that are have an interest to various parties such as the statistical neighborhoods, city council, RTD, Denver Public Schools, we just want to make sure that their needs geographically can align cleanly with the new election precincts. So once we have these areas, it just kind of becomes a mathematical process. Within each of those uh, unique district areas, we know how many active registered voters are in there. We divide that by our rough target population for each precinct of active voters. That tells us how many precincts can be made. After that, it kind of becomes a process like building with Legos. We use GIS software, which Kathy will describe further uh, in her presentation, uh, but we use this software to start combining election, or sorry, census blocks, and it aggregates up the number of active registered voters while also maintaining uh, records of all the demographic and census data behind it, population data, because that will be more relevant to city council. So we start clicking these all together until we reach that magical number for the precinct size and we have election precincts. While going through this process on the next slide, you can see some of the goals that we focus on um, while building these election precincts are the, the first two are more of a best practice. There are no legal guidelines when it comes to election precincts, but as a best practice, we try to maintain uh, as balanced an election uh, population within each precinct, and we want to try and keep these as contiguous and compact as possible. Now, because we are at the mercy of the state boundaries, we found once we did an overlay of all these areas, there were some geographic shapes that were forced us to have uh, a non-contiguous precinct as well as the population can't always be as balanced as we like. But the nice thing is election precincts don't really hold any political power or leverage, they're more in place to help simply with the administration of an election. So if we can't meet those, it's not the end of the world. Beyond that, we certainly want to try and keep things as simple as possible. Coordinating elections is quite complex and the less complexity we can have in the system, the better off we are. We want to avoid split precincts, which are boundaries that don't line up with other political entities such as RTD or DPS. So we do coordinate with them to try and uh, improve the contiguity of our boundaries. We also want to minimize the precinct count as much as possible. That impacts several areas such as the design, printing, proofing, the cost behind creating ballots every election, programming the voting hardware, the counting machines, 
interacting with the statewide registration database and so on. So trying to minimize the number of precincts to help simplify the overall system. And beyond that, we certainly want to complete this as quickly as possible. For those of you who don't know, there was a several month delay in the census releasing their data this year, and that kind of had a domino effect on all entities involved in redistricting, uh, you know, from the independent state commissions to local election divisions, as well as you know, city, county and commissioner districts across the state. So it's critical to get this done as quickly as possible. There were a few constraints that we do have to follow. Absolutely, as Doug mentioned before, election precincts cannot cross over these congressional and legislative boundaries. Um, and then beyond that, this year compared to when we did this 10 years ago, there was an increase in the size of the election precincts allowed. Uh, this time we were dictated, it was dictated that we need to create one precinct per roughly every 1500 up to 2000 active registered voters. Um, People ask why that's changed. A lot of that has to do with the actual voting models in place at the different times. 10 years ago, we had what was called a polling place model where the precincts had to be much smaller because we didn't have the technology that we have nowadays. Voters were assigned one specific location where they had to go vote. We used paper poll books to make sure that they had, you know, that they were registered. They'd only voted once. Uh, voters weren't allowed to register on the same day they vote. It was just a, a much, it required a much smaller geographic area to be able to maintain and control the voting situation. Denver as well as Colorado now uses what's called a mail ballot model where any voter can vote at any voting location across the city. They can turn their ballot in at a 24 hour drop box. Uh, they can even put it back in the mail to get that ballot back to us. So it just, this new model basically negates the need to have smaller geographic precincts. Um, and finally, on the last slide, to give a quick update as far as where the elections division is at in the reprecincting process, now that the state boundaries have been finalized, we are close to completing our precinct plan. After that, we hope to get a public comment period where we release this data to the public and allow them to comment on it entities such as you know, the political parties, city council, other communities of interest always seem to kind of have opinions on what their precinct should look like. So we're going to open it up to hear from them. And then we need to be able to finalize and hand off these precincts to city council so they can get to work and, and recreate their uh, city council districts from there. And so at this point, I will hand it off to Kathy where she'll go into more detail on that. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. So my name's Kathy Zern and I'm a senior GIS analyst in technology services and I was brought on to help out with this redistrict, redistricting pro process and um, do some maps and analysis as well as learn the software and do some training. So I'm going to start out with this map. This shows the population change by district from 2010 to 2020 for the city and county of Denver. The districts are labeled with the district numbers as well as the population gain. Overall, Denver did grow. It didn't lose any population in the last 10 years. And you can see that it is symbolized by the amount of growth. So we considered a district stable if it had a gain of less than 1800. And those are gray on the map. You can see that's district two and three. And we considered a district to have a major gain if they gained more than 13,000 in population in the last 10 years. And as you can see, that is district eight, nine, and 11. So most of the growth in the previous 10 years happened to the north and to the northeast in the city. So one of the goals, as Steve said, of redistricting is to rebalance the population of each district. So the way Denver does that is we take the total population for the city of Denver from the U.S. Census and for 2020 that was 715,522 and we divide that by the number of districts in the city which is 11. So that's how we came up with this target population of 65,047. So that's the target population for each district after the redistricting process is complete. No district should be more than 10% different from another district. 
So this map is showing the percent of deviation from the target. You have yellow is low, less than 5% deviation, which is about 3,200 people. Orange is moderate, between 5 and 10%. And then dark orange is a high deviation, percent deviation from the target. And looking at the previous map where we saw that districts two and three were considered stable, you can see that they are labeled with the difference from the target population. So District 2 is 8,663 below the target population, and District 3 is 8,867 below the target population, which kind of makes sense because they didn't grow as much as, say, Districts 8, 9, and 11 that are significantly over the target population. And then this is the table showing the voting age demographics for 2020. It's broken down by district, and then it has the total voting age population according to the U.S. Census in 2020 for each district, as well as being broken out by race and ethnicity. And then along the bottom, you have the cumulative totals for each column. So this table is going to change after the redistricting process is complete and after the maps are redrawn, because this is how it stood in 2020 with the current boundaries. So I think that's a good segue for me to do a demo of the software that we're going to be using um, to redraw the districts. So this is Maptitude Online. Um, we will have this available to, like Doug said, to City Council and the public. Um, I have a Maptitude uh, for redistricting desktop software that allows me to build plans to put in Maptitude Online for everybody to use. So the first thing you'll see when you come to this website is you'll have to create an account and you would click on New User you have to create an account because you're going to be able to save plans. You're going to be able to share plans. So they just ask for a username, password, an email address. They'll send you a link in your email to activate your account. Let them know you're not a robot and go ahead and create user. A couple things I want to say before logging in about this is this is a multilingual website. And you can see across the bottom, you can use the website in English, Spanish, Portuguese, Vietnamese, Korean, and Chinese. And I believe that they said that was Mandarin. You can also make those changes up here. And when you do change it, all of the screen controls change. So that's pretty handy. I'm going to keep it in English. That's my best language. Um, and then one other thing over here is this help. So the very first time you come to this page, you have this quick start guide. And I know a lot of times help is not very helpful. This help is actually very helpful. It walks you through creating your user account, creating a new plan. It goes step by step, explaining what each of the boxes and the tools are in a lot more detail than I'm going to go into today, all the way through verifying and submitting your plan. So I'm going to go ahead and log in. So the first thing that pops up is this plan manager box. And once you start creating plans, they will show up right here. You can see I've created a couple, so they're going to show up here. The very first time you log in, you're just going to click on new plan because this will be blank. So when you click on new plan, there's a couple of tabs here. This initial tab, I'm going to create some plans on the desktop software with various layers and constraints, only allowing you to create 11 districts, for example. And then what you'll do is you'll choose one of these, you'll hit create, and it'll allow you to make a copy of that plan and start working on it yourself. This other shared tab, once you get in and create an account and other people start sharing um, their plans with you, they're, they're gonna show up right here. So for now, I'm just going to click on existing districts, and then it wants you to give it a name. GIS day demo. Click OK. So now let me introduce you to this screen. When you first create a plan, the toolbox window and the changes window always open up by default. And I'll come back to those in just a minute. Up here again, 
tips. I would highly recommend anybody getting into the software for the first time to go through tips. What tips does is it walks you around the screen and it explains what each piece does. You can click through it. I'm not going to do all of it. And again, here's help. Once you're in the plan, it tells you how to modify districts in the plan and you can scroll up and down. Go ahead and click help to close that. And here are the map tools over here in the upper left. You have a zoom in tool, zoom out. Um, click on that and you can zoom into the map. You can zoom back out. And you can also display the initial map. And this is another thing is anytime you hover over any of the tools, if you're not sure what it does, it tells you exactly. So let's look at this options box. So all of these windows to open and close them, you just click on the three bars up here. So this is really a layers and a legends box. You can decrease the label size on the map. Not able to turn labels off. Um, and this map is strictly for demo purposes. So once, once we get into the final maps, I'm going to adjust the scaling for the labels. So you have various themes. I don't have any of that set up, so I'm not going to get into that right now. But here's all of your map layers. Streets, major streets. This map is symbolized by these statistical neighborhoods, and you can see they're also labeled that way. Precincts, current districts, and then districts as you draw them in the plan, they are outlined in this yellow, as well as a scale. If you click on layers, you have the ability to turn off some of the layers. If there's a layer that you're trying to turn off, but you can't, for example, precincts, it's because you need to have that layer on in order for the tools to work over here in the toolbox. Go back and turn some of these on. Close that box. So this window down here, this is the districts and this is the district information. So it's districts in your plan 11, the target is 11. And again, here's your target population for each district of 65,047. You see each district over here on the left with their population information, the deviation and the deviation percentage from that target population, as well as a breakdown of race and ethnicity. I go ahead and close that. So now coming back to the toolbox. The toolbox contains all of the tools that you're going to use to create your districts. So to start out, your target, you see the word itself is green. The target, if you hover your mouse over the drop down, you can see this is the district you wish to increase in size. Source is red, and this is the existing district that you wish to select from. And your selection will always be precincts because as Steve was saying, you always use precincts to build your districts. And then these are the tools we're going to use to modify the districts. So I am going to, and this is just for demonstration purposes, this isn't what I'm suggesting happen. I'm going to zoom into between District 8 and District 5. So District 8 has a population 12.5% over the target population. And District 5 has a current population of negative 8.15% under the target population. So what I want to do is I want to add population to District 5, and I'm going to take it away from District 8. So my target, again, to hover over the drop down, you can see this is the district you wish to increase in size. For demonstration purposes, my target's going to be 5. And you can see down here, pending changes. This is the box you'll look at to review the changes that you're making in real time. My source, I'm going to choose District 8. You can see District 5 is outlined in green because that's my target, and District 8 is outlined in red because that's my source. So I'm going to go ahead and use one of the selection tools, and we'd like to try to keep neighborhoods together whenever possible. So half of East Colfax neighborhood is in District 5, and the other half is in District 8. I want to move all of East Colfax neighborhood to District 5. So I'm going to go ahead and select one of the precincts. And right away down here, you can see these are the pending changes. Just by adding that one precinct to District 5, the percent deviation from the target dropped to only 4.9%. 
and eight went down to 9.2%. That's not good enough, so I'm going to choose the other half of East Colfax neighborhood. Now the percent deviation for District 5 is at 1.6% below the target, and eight is at 5.9% above the target. I'm satisfied with that, so I'm gonna go ahead and click OK. Now you can see those two precincts got added to District 5, and the numbers on the map changed. Five is now at a negative 1.58% below the target, and eight is at 5.93% above the target. So I'm satisfied with that. Now I'm gonna do some plan integrity. Up here, you can find an unassigned area. You click on that, and this says there are no unassigned areas. An unassigned area would be a precinct that hasn't been assigned to a district. It's good that there are no unassigned areas. Click OK. Another integrity we can check are finding non-contiguous districts. So as you heard Steve talk about in his presentation, there are some parts, some precincts that are going to be non-contiguous. And there are some parts of Denver geographically, just by the way that it's laid out, that are non-contiguous. And this, the software has caught that. So this is telling me in District 6, there's an area that's non-contiguous. So I can highlight it, zoom to it, move this over, and I will zoom out just a little bit so you can see that it's not connected. So the software is going to catch it and say that it's non-contiguous, but it belongs to District 6, and we are just going to ignore that for now. So there's some reports you can also run in the software. One of them is a measures of compactness report. So the only measure of compactness they are checking for in the online software is this REOC measure of compactness. When I do the QAQC with the plans that are submitted on the desktop software, I believe there's 11 different measures of compactness it will check for. And looking through, it goes district by district, and then at the bottom, it tells you that the measure should always be between zero and one, with one being the most compact. So it gives you a little bit of explanation of what you're looking at. So finally, let's pretend that I am ready to submit this plan. What I would do in this case is I would click on Submit Plan, and a box would come up, and it would give you the opportunity to fill in some information to explain why you believe this is the best plan. And you fill out some more information, and then you'll get an email thanking you for submitting your plan. It will come to me for additional QAQC, and the idea is that we are going to build a dashboard to put submitted plans from the public as well as submitted plans from city council members um, so everybody can review them. And that being said, that was a quick and dirty demo of Maptitude Online for redistricting, and I really look forward to getting all of your plans. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Kathy and Steve and Doug. Um, very important, big process that the city is undergoing right now, something we have to do every 10 years, and it is a big project. Um, Bruce, it looks like we got a, one question in there, or maybe two questions. Yeah, we have two questions. I believe one is for Kathy and, and one is for Steve. So the one for Kathy is, uh, does the software have accessibility options, colorblind, friendly, screen reader, et cetera? Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, I don't know that the software itself has that. Doug, do you know? I do not know, but we will check into that for sure. For sure. That's a good question. Can you modify that red and green? boundaries for the source and target or is that that's just labeled that way by default that's labeled that way by default and i don't know if that would be a code change or if that's something we can just easily do in the settings yeah, right cool. and we have a question for steve which would be how do you re redraw districts depending on registered democrats and republicans like 50 50. Uh, another good question uh to be honest, when it comes to election precincts, because they are not political in and of themselves, that is not taken into consideration at all. It is merely the raw number of active registered voters irrelevant of their party affiliation. Uh, it would be kind of impossible to do that in some place like Denver, which is primarily blue and Democrat registered. Uh, 
that wouldn't even be possible. <laughs> but so no, that is not taken into consideration. I don't know if uh, the state or council will take that into consideration, but that's not really even data that's built in uh, at this point. So we just have raw numbers of actives. Are council councils typically like party agnostic? Aren't they even the mayors generally part party? Not, candidates generally don't run on a party platform. Correct. I, I don't think I mean to to keep it from being more political than it already is. Party affiliation would just throw a monkey wrench in there and, and make it even more complicated. So that's not really considered. Cool. All right. Uh, I think Bruce is going to throw out a question on the previous presentation. That's correct. And the uh, question we have, and by the way, um, I will reply to you in the uh, chat. And if you could give me some contact information, especially if you've logged in uh, anonymously, so we can verify you when we when we get the uh, when the answer. Um, the question here is: uh, What is the target population for a new city council district in Denver? All right. Who was who was taking notes? Well, there, there is one more question. Uh, I missed the name of the software. Is this ArcGIS Pro? This is not ArcGIS Pro. This is Maptitude Online for redistricting that we're going to be rolling out um, publicly and internally to recreate the districts. Cool, and I think we'll drop that in the chat, the name of that. Oh, thanks, Bruce. Um, all right, I think that's all the questions for that presentation, so we're going to keep moving on. Our next presentation is going to be on um, Esri Social Equity Analysis Solution, kind of a sneak peek. So I think this is a new a new solution that Esri has been developing that um, the City and County of Denver has been um, heavily involved in. So we have a couple, someone from Esri, and also from um, another presenter from the Mayor's Office of Social Equity and Innovation, uh, Rachel Galton and Michael Brown. Thanks. Yeah, I'll share my screen for a few minutes and then I'll pass it over to Mike. So good morning. My name is Rachel Galton. I'm the Racial Equity Data Analyst with the Mayor's Office of Social Equity Innovation and Innovation or OSCI. And I'll be giving some brief background on our office and our partnership with Esri before passing it over to Mike to share more about the solution. So just for a little background on myself and my office, uh, OSCI was officially established in 2020 by Executive Order 146, though several employees um, of existing city agencies had already kind of begun forming our office's work in 2018 and 2019. Some examples of the work that we currently do at the City of Denver include providing race and social justice training to all city employees, coaching EDI teams on their racial equity action plans, and conducting equity-focused analyses and evaluations. I specifically joined the city at the end of June as our office's first data analyst, and so I'm working on building relationships and partnering with different agencies on some of the types of analyses that I mentioned. Since I know there are folks in our GIS and data community that I haven't had a chance to meet yet, um, please feel free to reach out to me if you think there might be opportunities to collaborate or if you have other questions about our office's work. Uh, I posted my email at the bottom of this slide. I also serve as our office's primary liaison in our partnership with GARE, the Government, Government Alliance on Race and Equity. GARE is a national network made up of member jurisdictions that share knowledge and resources with one another to advance racial equity. And so a number of the efforts of our office were originally built using some of the tools and frameworks that GARE has developed. And so in late 2020, GARE partnered with Esri, the creators of GIS, to create mapping solutions to racial equity. Gare and Esri invited five jurisdictions to participate in a pilot partnership to identify and craft what spatial analysis tools might help jurisdictions understand different questions like how, in, how inequities are geographically distributed, op, how to operationalize racial equity in their decision making, evaluating impacts, and then adapting strategies in response to the findings of this tool. And so from this pilot, the group of member jurisdictions, along with partners from Esri and Gare, identified the need for a tool that can both identify inequities based on specific variables like income and race, um, as well as understand whether existing resource and service locations um, offered by the city are equitably distributed. Um, so I and a few other GIS folks from the city of Denver had the opportunity to test an early version of this social equity analysis tool and provided feedback for the final solution, which I believe um, is being released um, very shortly. So with that, I'll pass it over to Mike Brown to give us a demo of the tool. 
Great, thank you, Rachel. Um, so I know this is called a sneak peek, but the solution is actually out as of yesterday. So uh, just to show you where you can find the solution if you want to deploy it right now. Um, so in ArcJS Online or now in ArcJS Enterprise 1091, which came out today, uh, you can go to your organization homepage, click on the app launcher here and launch the solutions app. So once you're in the solutions app, you can search for it or browse um, for social equity analysis. And you'll get this gallery page with some details about the solution. You can deploy the solution or hit this learn more button to jump over to uh, the doc intro page and just read about the licensing requirements or just what's included with the solution. Um, once you deploy, you'll get a solution item in your organization that has a couple of apps in it. So one is this uh, social equity analysis pro package, which has a set of tasks to help walk you through this analysis. And then you also get a map and app so that you can share results that you get from the pro package out to a web app. So just to show you what the pro package looks like before I kind of walk through the functionality of it, um, when you download the pro package, there will be tasks. So when you open those up, here's what it looks like in the left pane. And if you're not familiar with tasks, what these do are really walk you through a set of tools and analysis uh, with documentation to help you in that process. So working with our pilot jurisdictions in GARE, um, which included the city and county of Denver, we listened to everyone's needs and a big need in the equity space is to create some sort of indexes. Um, so a common example of this is the CDC's social vulnerability index, uh, but there's different needs uh, for local jurisdictions, different types of indexes that they want to create. Um, so this is really a set of tools to help walk through to create a few different info products. Um, and I'll show an example here in a second. So you can get to know the social equity analysis solution, and this is where kind of the deep methodology behind the tools and the math that's actually happening is documented if you want to read more about it. And then you can start walking through the solution. So I'm going to jump back over into a story map, but uh, just for an example, what I looked at using these tools are I brought in Denver block groups and looked at these Head Start program locations, so schools for kids, um, to be able to analyze are they really you know, meeting the need that exists in the community. And if they're not, where would it be a good location to locate a new one based on the need that we derive from the index tools? Um, so kind of a high level workflow is you can bring your own uh, geographic boundaries. So in this case, that's those Denver block groups, but this could be, you know, census tracts, uh, council districts, school districts, pretty much any boundary data that you have. Um, you can gather community asset condition or outcome data. So this can be anything, anything spatial. So in this case, I'm really just analyzing these Head Start program locations and using those just as kind of a single count that I'm aggregating onto the boundary um, for a stat, but that could be anything. It could be, um, you know, maybe access to high-speed internet at home, um, food access, anything like that. So really uh, bring your own data and then what the tools do is help you extract that and aggregate it onto a boundary so you can use that to do some spatial analysis. Next, we can add some demographic data using Esri's Enrich tool. Um, we're calling these community characteristics. So you can bring your own data or use the tools within the ProTask to add that data on. Um, and then using these two, you can take a normalized kind of condition or condition rate that you can generate using the tool and then create a community characteristics index by identifying some focus variables and then aggregating those two together to create an access surface or an equity analysis index is what we're calling it. But it's really equally weighting kind of that access to a certain condition or asset and 
the focus populations or demographics that you're interested in to come out with, you know, is, I guess, is that asset location or condition really meeting the community need? And then you can use this equity analysis index as input to choose new locations based on some candidate sites. So I did this analysis and published up some maps just to try to make it a little more visual instead of watching you uh, make you watch me walk through pro. <laughs> um, so in the evaluate conditions and action steps, you can identify some demographic data, add those onto your boundaries and summarize those locations onto your boundaries as well. So again, those head start locations. So here I started with just these two layers. That was it in my analysis. So I have these block groups that didn't have any demographic data and then head start program location. So using the tasks, I can add demographic data. So working with GARE and speaking to the pilot jurisdictions, we identified a lot of common variables that are available through the enrich tool mostly ACS and census data that you can aggregate onto your boundaries. So this will be kind of a great one to one for any sort of uh, census boundaries that are out there. But if you use council districts or school districts, it will apportion that data. Um, so you can read more about that in the documentation, but essentially it uh, interpolates the census data and then kind of takes a portion of those stats and applies it to a different geography other than a census or ACS geography. So imperfect, but it's a good tool to use um, if you're familiar with the local area to analyze maybe spending at a council district level or looking at capital improvement projects or something like that. Um, so here's the variables, the demographic variables. I'm not gonna focus too much here, but just wanted to add this in as a visual. So lots of race and ethnicity data, so you can aggregate or disaggregate as needed. Economic, health, transportation, education, technology, and housing. Um, so these are all flexible. You can use all of them or you can use none of them and uh, bring in other variables from the enrich tool or find your own data and bring that. So once we have that data in and we aggregate those Head Start locations onto the boundaries, I can come up with a condition rate. So in this case, I can normalize those Head Start locations by some sort of other stat. So in this case, I normalized by child population zero to four years old, because those are kids who would be eligible for those Head Start programs. Um, this is kind of a deceiving map um, because the dark green areas are areas that have a 0% rate. They're just uh, an area that doesn't have any Head Start program. Next, we can identify community characteristics. So what we're calling these are focus factors or focus variables. So here you identify out of the demographics that are loaded in, you identify variables where you're interested in a high value or a low value, if that's more relevant. So just for some examples, um, for Head Start programs, you might wanna analyze households with an income below poverty level. So you're interested in a higher number of those because you're really trying to get access to the um, ECE for kids. Um, and then for a focus factor, low to high might be um, maybe median income. I think I made a mistake here. So income, uh, household income. So you would be interested in household income that might be lower on average or the median household income. And then you can generate uh, the community characteristics index. So this is really a need or a focus surface. Um, so a lower score. So one would be kind of the highest need or highest focus area based on the variables we identified. And 481, the highest rank would be lowest need or lowest focus. So now we have that condition rate map and the community characteristics index map. And we can use those two generated stats to create an equity analysis index. So in both of those cases, we're interested in a lower condition rate in this case, because it would be lower access to a Head Start program and a lower rank, which would be kind of the higher focus. And we create a new ranked surface. So here, what we're looking at is the output equity analysis index. So just by clicking here, we see that a lower rank value in dark blue indicates an area of higher need and a higher rank value in light green is an area of lower need. 
So this boundary right here happens to be um, the highest need area based on that condition rate and the community characteristics index inputs that we used. And then this is actually the info product that we shared out um, using the solution. So when you generate that map in Pro, you can share it up to ArcGIS Online, add it into the map, and it becomes present here. And there are arcade expressions to help calculate the stats for the pop-up here. So this is automatically generated in the desktop map, and then you can share it up to online and it becomes part of your web map. You can also see a legend and see the potential range. So these are symbolized by quantile. So, you know, you could renumber these and have, you know, one through five um, and just really so show a range of need throughout the community. So these are kind of flexible tools that met the need that we were hearing from all our GAIR pilot jurisdictions. And so you think about like creating an equity index or an equity atlas, like we've seen from some communities. You can use these tools to kind of iteratively walk through and create a jobs index or a health index if you know the community characteristics that you're interested in focusing on for each of those and commute or create these different indices uh, for analysis and sharing those with different stakeholders, both internal and external. So kind of the final piece of this analysis is uh, we heard the need for using that need surface or that ranked surface to identify a good asset location. Say you have you know, some candidate asset locations and based on that need you want to meet, how do you pick which are the best? So we have some tools to do that using um, network uh, analysis. So in this case, it's actual travel time. So you can do walk time or drive time analysis. So it's imperfect, but uh, I think a good place to start and kind of walk through different scenarios for folks. Uh, so what we're looking at here is that equity analysis index rank surface and this pink polygon is coverage polygon. So based on the existing locations, which we see here called required in this case, but the gray flags are all existing Head Start programs. And this coverage polygon is the percent of the population needs that are met that are within a 10 minute drive time to one of these locations. So 83% of the population in Denver has access to one of these locations and then anywhere outside this pink polygon, but within city and county boundaries uh, isn't within a 10 minute drive. So, you know, we could bump that up to 15 minutes and see who has access and just kind of iteratively walk through this. Uh, just for the sake of today, I brought in some candidate locations. So these orange locations are Denver public school locations. So if we want to identify uh, a campus that we might be able to set up another Head Start program that happened to be a Denver public school. What we could do is run the last few steps in the analysis. And what this will do is create a demand point for each of these uh, polygons. So what these are, are really centroids of these polygons or these block groups so that we can get kind of an average drive time for each of the polygons to one of our candidate locations. And so what the tool does is does the network analysis get again and then aggregates those demand points to a specific facility. So it chooses a facility based on the inputs that you put in saying, you know, if I want to be within 10 minute drive time, which would be the best facilities to bring online to meet the need. And so it identifies all of these different facilities based on that. Um, so we figured this was a good way to kind of iteratively walk through um, some sort of analysis to help you pick a location based on the need that exists in the community. So that was pretty high level fast walkthrough of the social equity analysis solution. So again, you can find that in the solutions app and go there to learn more. Any questions come in? Awesome, thank you. Yeah, so we're, they were hoping, could you drop the URL to that story map into the Q&A chat and yep. any of those other um, resources as well? For sure, yeah, we have a new gallery app 
that's part of the solutions app. So it's kind of a public facing version of that. So I'll drop that in as well as the story map so you can play around with it. Great, thank you. Um, anyone that's been familiar with some of our, our last few GIS Day events, um, you'll see that there's kind of a, a theme running through is really the equi equitable distribution of services by the city, um, a big goal of the mayors, and something that you, we continually see GIS playing a big role in, um, in helping um, with, with that uh, part of providing services to the city. All right, any, I don't think we're seeing any quest other questions on the presentation. Uh, so I'm gonna kick it over to Bruce to um, throw out the question about the presentation. Uh, we don't have a, a question for this particular presentation. All right, then we, were, uh, we will move on to our next presentation. Um, our next one is someone that many of you are probably familiar with, uh, Lisa Piscopo um, from Denver Human Services, and she is part of DHS's financial, uh, she's a financial and strategic analysis. Um, she's going to be presenting on GIS guiding strategies and investments in Denver Human Services, the DHS index. All right, um, over to you, Lisa. Thank you. I was trying to post the um, link to this here so that you can all follow along, but it is not posting. Um, Did you drop it in the Q&A? I was trying to, yeah. I'll drop it in the chat. Oh. I'll drop it in the chat. Maybe someone else can help me out uh, by passing it over there. No problem. OK, got it. Um, so thank you guys so much for including me today. GIS Day is my like favorite day of the year, as geeky as that sounds. Um, I love sharing what we're working on in the city and also learning about what other folks are doing. Uh, so I'm now in Denver Human Services, um, and it, we have a motto in Denver Human Services where we envision a healthy community where people are connected, supported, safe, and well. well with this goal in mind, I've developed a mapping tool highlighting priority neighborhoods to better align DHS staff um, around a common set of data that can help guide decision making and implementation of services. And so this really is a great way to um, show an application of developing an index like the one that was just presented um, for a very specific agency to accomplish very specific tasks. Um, so we have an online story map, which you all have access to here. Um, this has been a really great tool in helping communicate a lot of um, seemingly out of reach data to policymakers and decision makers within Denver Human Services uh, to make better decisions around uh, their investments. Um, it also really does provide us with um, a transparency tool so people can understand why we're making the decisions in our investments that we're making and it holds uh holds us accountable uh to being able to deliver services to where they're needed most in the city uh and so what i did here was uh i created this tool to uh, better understand the unique characteristics of each of our neighborhoods um and i aggregated these 16 key indicators by neighborhood uh, into one summary map, which highlights priority neighborhoods for which our services and engagement are crucial uh, to providing families with the services they need to thrive. So here are all of our um, indicators that were aggregated together, and I'll go through each one of those in turn. Um, but this is the result of that statistical aggregation. So like um, the maps that you've already seen today, uh, the darker blue colors here highlight areas in the city and county of Denver where folks may face more challenges uh, to success. Maybe they need, um, they are facing multiple barriers. Uh, I, I like to talk about cumulative disadvantage and advantage by place. Um, so we can understand where our DHS supports might be needed most. Uh, and this is a great tool in that it aligns all of our 1200 staff in Denver Human Services uh, to focus on these priority neighborhoods when looking at where implementation of programs should be, uh, uh, should take place. And so what I want to show you here now 
is um, the animation. Esri provides a great tool. Again, I can't say this enough. The geographic information systems and the maps really help bring uh, people who aren't used to using data on board and understanding the disparities by place, understanding um, uh, um, how opportunity is different by place. Again, kind of subliminally in interjecting the equity analysis. Um, and, and lately, uh, we've been talking very clearly about the equity disparities um, in, in this work. So Esri is really a great partner in helping us present the information in, in an accessible way for decision makers. So what this animation is showing you is all 16 indicators mapped individually. Um, if you were to stop this and click on any one neighborhood, you could bring up the data for those particular indicators. As I mentioned earlier, we are looking at both health, education indicators, and community indicators in this aggregation. These indicators were all ones that were important to DHS staff in the work that they're doing. And so when you look at how they all um, impact a community when aggregated together, it really does help guide the work in a more targeted and strategic way. So households without internet access, people in poverty uh, is scrolling by now. Uh, and then the foreign born population. Unemployment. The violent crime rate. People over the age of 65. And again, you all have the link to this, so you can stop and scroll through and explore. There's a lot and lot, a lot of data included, um, and you can lend your own expertise to what it is you're seeing um, and all the information that's flying right by you. The last indicator we used was cost burdened housing um, of those uh, 16, um, those 16 indicators. And so what what results is that. Uh, the index map that you saw earlier. And the last thing I wanted to share with you today is once we have that index and get everybody on board as to where our priority neighborhoods are, how do we actually use this uh, to drive decision making? Um, and partly as a result of COVID, uh, we've learned in Denver Human Services that a lot of folks can't access our services, especially when our primary building, buildings are closed. So it was assumed that folks could access everything online. Um, but as one of the indicators in the index show, a lot of folks in the city and county of Denver don't have access or computer literacy uh, to the internet um, and weren't able to access the resources they needed that way. Others are very far from our primary locations, uh, such as in Southeast Denver circled here. Um, one of our uh, staff members actually uh, said it took um, five bus transfers and three hours time if you live in this part of Denver to reach the main building over here at, at Castro uh, to re receive services. And so given this information um, and the need, especially during the pandemic, to get resources out to the public, um, DHS leadership decided to try a pilot program in which we use the index to identify five areas of the city um, that we felt we could pilot uh, satellite offices or neighborhood sites per se to better deliver services in community. Now this is a this isn't all just about GIS. It's also about building management and finding uh, locations in the city where we can locate these. Uh, these neighborhood sites. And so we've got uh, five that were intended to go up to stand up this year. Um, one in Montbello. This one is the Epworth Church. This one in five points here is really at the St. Francis Center and is primarily geared towards uh, serving the homeless population near the Central Business District in Denver. And then this one is the Pena Center uh, located at the new uh, healthcare clinic on Federal. And so the only sites that are up right now is the Pena site, which is down here. And we're beginning to collect data on the types of uh, services people are requesting at that site. Um, who's coming in? How far are they traveling uh, to get those services? Um, we'll aggregate those data as well as track how many of the uh, folks are receiving services 
how many are new clients and how many are receiving services more conveniently from before and we're using administrative data to do that uh, and then we're still looking for a site in this area though i think we're close um, to including one for the rocky mountain services uh, human services building for the southeast section of the city but this is an important place uh, because it's so distant from the city center um, and folks here were in great need and they were actually going across the county boundaries to Aurora to receive services instead of accessing them in their own county. So we really see a great need for including um, a satellite office or um, a neighborhood site in, in the southeast area of the city. Uh, um, we have um, one site up and running, like I said, at Pena. We have two that will be up and running by December 1st. And then the other two in Montbello and Southeast should, should be open by the first of the year. Uh, after we do these analysis, we'll do more, um, uh, more work in identifying whether or not these satellite offices are working, if we're delivering services more effectively and efficiently to our clients, and where we maybe want to expand um, these programs moving forward. Uh, and I'm advocating every day that we should be doing that within um, the context of looking at the disparities by geography and place and the barriers that exist for our constituents to receive these services. So I'm, I'm really excited about the way our leadership has embraced this new technology, to them a new technology, uh, to us not so much, right? But um, they've really embraced this technology to have a more data driven approach to delivering services in the city and county. And I hope to share more with you next year about how well all of these efforts are going. Let me stop there and, and open it up for questions or and then if there aren't any, I'll pass it back. <clears throat> we do not have any questions yet. Yeah, no questions in the in the chat. Uh, really, really cool work. You always do uh, really amazing, cool things with story maps. <laughs> uh, you've been one of the biggest proponents of story maps, I think, that have really, really got a lot of people around the city to start adopting this um, this tool. At all. So re really nice work. Really cool. Well, thank you. You know what? If I can say one more thing, um, I've tried for years and years and years to get folks to latch on to uh, data-driven decision making and I, I've produced the books with the paper maps in them for years and years and years and I haven't been able to get people to bite right but this these interactive tools and giving folks the ability to click on um, oh I, I should show you that probably too to click on the um, on the information here and lend their own expertise you can click on any of the neighborhoods and get all the data uh, that make up that score for for that particular neighborhood. Um, and this has been the most successful I've been, both with community, with partners, and with leadership in the city um, to help people uh, be able to use data in a way that's meaningful to them um, to, start, to start moving the work. So thank you ESRI people. Thank you GIS people. It's, um, it's a great tool to really make, uh, make data accessible to more people. Awesome. Yeah, that's great to hear that that's it's really making some inroads with uh, decision makers. Yeah. Um, all right, so I don't see any questions, so I think we're going to go ahead and move on to our next presentation. Um, the next one is going to be on a 2D storm model model, model standardization. And this comes from uh, Jennifer Williams, who is with our DOTI or our Department of Transportation and Infrastructure um, Department. And then uh, Wilson Wheeler, who is also from HDR. So I'm going to kick it over to them. Good morning, everybody. Um, I am Jennifer Williams with the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure, and I'm here with Wilson. I'm grateful to have him here from HDR to help us present on the 2D, uh, two-dimensional modeling and its integration with um, GIS. Um, before I get started, I did want to thank a couple folks, uh, Don Jacobs, who uh, from Ingenuity, who did a lot of this work, uh, Lisa Froshog, who is the project manager for everything on this project, and Jim Turner from Development Engineering Services. Over the last 10 years, the City and County of Denver has conducted many two-dimensional hydraulic modeling projects, and these help us better understand stormwater runoff and the associated areas of inundation 
or um, basically where flooding occurs. Uh, we in the city, we call those our potential inundation areas and the models help us understand the extent and the severity of the flooding. Um, as part of our 2019 storm drainage master plan, we created a GIS database uh, to store the results of all these models. We had uh, 51 studies that we used um, It included over 5 million grid cells and about 15 square miles of the city. So about to date, about 25% of the city and county of Denver has been modeled. So you can see in the map that the uh, lemon color is the areas that have been mapped um, and then the remainder gray areas have not been mapped yet. Um, so you can imagine that we're going to keep going on this. We've got a lot more to do. We've only done 25% of the city and um, over time we're going to do more of these studies. Um, since this work could be done across different agencies or a different with different consultants, we wanted to create some standards that would establish consistent modeling practices to create consistent modeling outputs. And that would be regardless of what 2D modeling software could be used. There's uh, several different options that could be used um, to develop standard GIS data deliverables from the 2D models. And um, these deliverables would use consistent formatting and attribute labeling, which would allow seamless integration into Denver's GIS system. And I am going to turn it over to Wilson to discuss the process. Thanks. Um, yeah, as Jennifer mentioned, um, there are about 50 2D models that have been done across the city um, over the years. And we basically took that data, the output data from those models, combined it into a single GIS database um, using the standards that, that Jennifer also just mentioned um, to kind of facilitate the process. Um, the data is then uh, made available through, through two, essentially two applications, which I'll talk more a little bit about here shortly, and then um, and Jennifer will also provide a little bit more detail on how um, how that information is used, including an example from development engineering services. And uh, so to give you an idea what kind of information is in this GIS database, there's there's quite a bit. We've got um, some study detail and study specific detail information. I should say that that's kind of baseline. Um, so who who did the who did the study and modeling, when it was done, the modeling software that was used, and even the topographic data source that was used for the model. Um, in addition to that, we've got some detailed information that's that's stored at the uh, at the model grid cell level, and that includes things like the ground surface elevation, water surface elevations, uh, the depth of the flow, and then velocity and also flow direction information. And so, uh, as I mentioned before, there's essentially two two applications that are primarily used to provide access to this this information. Um, the first is the potential inundation web map, and um, uh, I'm not going to take credit for that. I, I want to point out that that uh, um, Spencer Percival and I think um, Andrew also had a part in this too from Denver Technology Services developed this with the help of uh, Jeremy Hamer from from Dottie as well. Um, and so this this application is a public facing uh, web map essentially that provides the public um, with with access to the information so that they can kind of easily identify where um, where the inundations occur for for the the um, the areas within the city that have been studied. Um, and then the second the second application is Map at Denver, which is the city's internal mapping application and um, the information included in both of these is essentially the same, except the map at Denver version has has more detail because it does include all of the attributes from the model output. And uh, to, to to give you an idea of um, the layers that the GIS database is used to generate um, several layers with varying um, levels of detail. Uh, on on the simple end of the spectrum, we've got what we call the the um, the greater than zero layer, which is essentially a single merged polygon that represents areas where the flow depth is greater than zero uh, inches or, or just greater than zero. Um, and then on the detailed side of things, we've got the actual model grid cells 
uh, which which include um, really all of the information and are also used to uh, generate the labels um, that you'll see here shortly. And then in addition to that, on the uh, public facing website, we've got um, a few reference layers, layers that are meant to help orient folks, so streets and parcels that'll help people navigate. Um, and then one other thing I, I wanted to point out here is um, because we're the the um, as Jennifer mentioned, I mean the, the volume of data that we're dealing with here is immense, you know, five million grid cells. And so um, to to make that more manageable, we've set up some scale dependencies within the web map to change the level of detail that the user sees as they zoom in. So this this um, uh, particular example here shows, Kind of what you see when you're zoomed out to about the neighborhood level and that's the the greater than zero um, layer that i mentioned before and then as you continue to zoom in you'll see next is what we call the classified flood depth layer and that just shows kind of where the the areas um, that are deeper than others exist and then finally as you zoom into about um, the building level you start to see the individual grid cells um, that come out of the model and this is where in this case, we have um, the flood depth labels that show up there. And so um, uh, with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to Jennifer, who's going to talk a little bit more about some examples of how this, this data is used. Thanks, Wilson. Um, so uh, the data um, has a, can have a, a ton of uses, which is pretty exciting um, from from the two different platforms. So from a map at Denver standpoint, um, obviously it's it's well used by development engineering services. They are able to take that more granular level data to use it with developers and they can understand their flood um, risk on an individual parcel level. And it lets them set finished floor elevations. Um, you know, we look at it and on for storm drainage information all of the time, um, but there is a lot of other uses too that I think maybe um, would be would be beneficial to mention. Um, we've used it on community planning and development neighborhood planning initiative projects um, to kind of highlight areas of the city that we could expect flooding to occur and to help um, suggest that maybe those areas should be repurposed. We've, we could use it with other agencies, Denver Parks and Rec, to let them know if we um, anticipate um, flooding in a park or if a park is being currently used as detention. It's an easy way to check. Um, for the public facing side, we have uh, the potential inundation web map that Wilson was mentioning earlier. And if you go to denvergov.org um, slash flood, it's kind of the second link if you scroll down a little bit, um, or you can just Google it as well, Denver flooding, and you should be able to find it. And that is a great resource for future homeowners to understand if a home, the home they may be considering purchasing, maybe in an area where we could expect flooding. Uh, it's a great resource for current residents to understand their own current risk and if they need to do some flood, flood proofing. Uh, developers can also use it in advance of purchasing parcels. And um, it's a great tool for everyone in the city to use for education and outreach as well. Um, so uh, it's been a really cool project and I think uh, having the standardization that Ingenuity and HDR have done will be really great to help us continue to build on those 51 studies and add more to the data set over time. So with that, I will open it up for questions. Thanks everyone for listening. Cool. Yeah, I don't see any questions coming in. Uh, Bruce dropped a link in there to this. I know the um, the Office of Emergency Management and their Emergency Operations Center uh, are running um, exercises this year that are focused on flooding, and we used a lot of this data and the FEMA floodplain data to really <clears throat> build realistic um, exercises uh, in the case of a flood because it does happen, and that's one of the bigger risks in Denver. So this is very important uh, data for us to have and uh, really understand uh, the vulnerabilities across the city. So thank you, guys. Um, I think Bruce has a question for the for the audience. I do, and the question for this particular topic is uh, name the three types of users who could benefit from the flood depth data. 
and that is posted and we'll be awarding a prize to the first correct answer. Cool. All right, so as you drop in your answers, we're going to move on to our next presentation. Um, and this is going to be, let's see. This is Austin. He's going, uh, Austin Smith from DITO, uh, from the Denver Economic um, Development and Opportunity Department. And he's going to be um, presenting on mapping DITO's COVID-19 relief aid. All right, it's all yours. All right, Austin. thank you. Can everyone see? I guess so. All right, so I'm Austin Smith. I'm a data specialist intern with uh, DITO. All right, so a little bit of background. Uh, DITO stands for Denver Economic Development and Opportunity Office. And over the 2020 uh, COVID-19 pandemic, we partnered with several other city agencies to help distribute relief out. And this was coordinated through several public and private efforts uh, through Mayor Michael Hancock's Economic Relief and Recovery Council. And it was intended to assist businesses, nonprofits, and employees. And this was done through three different programs. The Small Business Emergency Relief Fund, which you'll see abbreviated as SBIRF, the Personal Protective Equipment Kit Dis Distribution, which you'll see uh, abbreviated as PPE, and the Nonprofit Emergency Relief Fund, which you'll see abbreviated as NPERF. So starting out with the uh, SBIRF there, uh, provided up to about $7,500 in grants to Denver businesses, and to qualify, uh, they needed to be located in the city and county of Denver, have an annual revenue of less than $2.5 million and have been operating uh, prior to March 26th of last year. And we received about 10,000 of these inquiries. And through this program, uh, we were able to distribute about 3,300 grants totaling um, just under $18 million, averaging about $5,300 per grant. Moving on to the PPE distribution, uh, similar qualifications, except for this one, we were targeting smaller businesses and nonprofits. So to qualify, organizations had to be located within City and County of Denver, uh, have fewer than 25 employees, and been operating prior to March 1st of last year. And we distributed just under 7,000 of these kits, uh, and each one valued about $315. And you see they included several um, hand sanitizers and face masks and um, useful stuff that the people needed. Moving on to the NPERF. So this was a one-time grant assistance up to $15,000 for uh, nonprofits. And this was really important to DDO because the, the communities of color have been experiencing systematic inequalities and they were disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. And the nonprofits that serve them run on really thin margins and even small disruptions in funding can cause a devastating effect in those neighborhoods. So we awarded just over 300 grants, totaling about three and a quarter million dollars and averaging right around $10,700 per grant. And you'll see, uh, I know equity was just mentioned in the couple previous presentations, and this was a big focus for us. So one of the key metrics that we tracked through this program was um, the organizations that were run or led by minority or women um, residents. And that you'll see that you'll see that abbreviated as MWBE. Uh, in the story map that I'll show here pretty soon. And so the data that I actually took, uh, there was about 10,000 entries from different organizations in all three programs. I had to geocode them all to get coordinates and I used the Denver address database validation tool and that that did really well. Um, it gave coordinates for about 80 to 85% and the rest I had to manually look up and enter in the coordinates. And then uh, just did some spatial joins. So moving on to the story map, here um <clears throat> there's a little bit of background that i just gave you on the programs and then um what we did is we aggregated them all together uh so this is all the relief all the relief programs uh donate or sent out to individual neighborhoods and this is interactive um and then you can see the funding here and this is aggregate funding it was about 20 million dollars distributed out uh, organization size and you can see a lot of these organizations the uh the max was 11 employees or the average uh, was 11 employees so we really were targeting small businesses and organizations here and then uh you can see the kpi of the minority and women-led organizations uh, percentages by the neighborhood 
And moving on, there's the background about the small business emergency relief. And it's really uh, similar to the, the aggregate. This is broken down by program here. And what I'd like to highlight here is that uh, we were really targeting small businesses and the average employee. No, none of the businesses had more employees than 16 the average in the neighborhood. And um, <clears throat> then we made this Power BI dashboard that uh, highlights it by a council district. And this will help supplement the map to uh, city council when it gets over to them. Moving on to the PPE kits. It's a similar breakdown. And again, highlighting the small organization uh, size. And again, with the uh, MWBE. But what we'd like to highlight here, and Dita was really proud to see that every neighborhood in Denver uh, received at least two PPE kits distributed to them through this program. And then there is a similar dashboard in here. If it'll load. That again breaks it down by uh, city council district and size, and it's just a different way to visualize um, the program. But finally, moving on to the NPERF, there's a little bit of that background and uh, similar maps made. But what we'd like to highlight here is the equity uh, factor of all of it, and as you can see, a large, almost all of the the Nonprofits that were uh, given relief were um, women or minority owned, which really highlights the equity that we're really proud to see. And another dashboard, and then there's a PDF list of all the businesses broken down by city council district that will supplement this map to uh, city council. And with that, I'll open it up to questions. Awesome, thanks Austin, that, that was really great. Uh, another great example of, of GIS helping equitably distribute um, services across the city once again. Um, it's such a powerful tool for that purpose. Um, I'm not seeing any questions coming in on that, on your presentation. Uh, I think Vanessa was asking, are there any policies created at the legislature level based off of these maps? Um, if you'll reply to that, I think that was based on the, on the flood maps or perhaps leases? I'm not quite sure who would. Uh, yeah, that was Jennifer, Jennifer and Wilson's uh, presentation. OK, yes, yeah, so I don't know if if, um, if Wilson wants to jump back on on that. And we do have oh, a question for Oz, Austin's presentation. <laughs> OK, have a, uh, Jennifer, have a, will you go first and, and then we'll uh, jump back over to Austin? Yeah, sure. Um, I was trying to write in the chat. I was trying to make sure it was for me, uh, so I apologize for the delay on that. Um, I don't know of any that are are done or any any policies that are being created. I will say that there is a differentiation between our potential inundation areas with FEMA regulated floodplains. So that's kind of how we distinguish it at the city. So something that's FEMA regulated would would be um, kind of a, more that federal level, whereas these um, localized flooding that we have modeled are not regulated um, federally. Cool. Yeah, OK, great. So yeah, difference between fit, uh, FEMA floodplains and then some of these potential inundation areas that may not have a requirement for any sort of special insurance needs or building types of restrictions. Uh, cool. All right, thank you. And then for Austin, uh, let's see, Bruce, do you have that question? Yes, I do. And the question for regarding Austin's presentation is how many programs were highlighted in Austin's presentation? Yes, yeah, so I think there were three types of they were targeting three different or three different programs that he highlighted. Um, you know, whoops, and I. Andrew is the way I, I, I went and answered the question. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, how, about, how about how about you uh, name one of them? Um, for the for the answer, uh, I apologize for that, Austin. Um, all right. So as you try to remember the name of one of those programs, one of those three programs, we Don't will listen. we will um, move on to our final presentation. So 
Uh, and this is a really cool one. Uh, uh, another one from coming from another city employee. This is um, this is gonna be Jim Casey from Dotty again, our, our Department of Transportation and Infrastructure, and he is doing. He's got a um, this really cool presentation on using drones for inspections, capturing infrastructure, and creating flythroughs. All right, so I'm gonna. It's all yours now, Jim. Oh, I'm sorry. Also, um, Joe Mirabel from uh, Parks and Rec as well. Sorry. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. Joe, Joe and I are going to be presenting together. I'm going to try and uh, uh, get the right screen working here and uh, not. There we go. Is that uh, I think that's going the showing up right. Uh, can you hear me OK? Yes. Thanks. Yes. All right. So, uh, going to be talking today, uh, myself and, and Joe Mirabile, about using drones for inspections, capturing infrastructure, and creating flythroughs. Um, Joe and I uh, did uh, both last year. Found ourselves doing a uh, couple of projects downtown in the Civic Center Park area and uh, later figured out that we were both there and doing had a lot of overlap between our work. This here is a 3D model of the city and county building, and it was made from uh, over 1300 images taken with a drone. Um, this building uh, and many other facilities nearby are examples of infrastructure that could be, uh, uh, that drones could be used to inspect or maintain more safely, more completely and more easily. So, uh, this uh, slide shows uh, basically the two drones that we use. These are not ours, but these are the same uh, make and model. Uh, I um, I used my own. Uh, I'm, I'm with Dottie and Joe's with Parks and Rec. So uh, I uh, Dottie did not have a, a drone, but they did have a use for a drone. So I just brought my own and uh, used that. And on the right there, that's Joe's uh, a Mavic 2 Pro, which is the same one that Joe used. And um, we both have our FAA licenses, our Part 107 pilots license. So we passed FAA exams and uh, are uh, licensed to do this at least. And um, let's see. Uh, so my project had uh, was off on the left. Um, I'm sorry, on the west side and the east side of Civic Center Park. One project was here on Bannock and uh, there was a street mural being installed. Uh, it was called Interwoven. And uh, before on the left is just Bannock Street and then Bannock was being closed off to traffic and uh, so no cars no longer uh, are there. And upon closing that off, there was a big street mural installed, as you can see on the right hand side there. Uh, these two pictures uh, show Broadway before and after uh, the, the Black Lives Matter mural was installed there. That was installed just on the heels of the mural on Bannock Street being installed like literally the next week. So uh, there was very little time to uh, to to think twice. It was just a matter of make a plan and go capture these. Um, one thing I wanted to point out that these uh, are nice pictures and you know people like to look at pictures of things, but they do have limited utility when you just kind of point and click. Uh, it's good. Uh, this the one on the right got a lot of airtime, but um, they after that they they might never be used much if any at all. So uh, instead of just taking more pictures like that, um, we're using a different method entirely, uh, which is to create what I call map imagery, ortho imagery, and uh, the pictures are taken straight down from the drone. Uh, in kind of a lawnmower pattern. As you can see there, there's the images all displayed up above the street. And um, with flight planning apps make the setup of this pretty easy to arrange. As you can see here, there's 42 camera positions, but it only took me about five minutes to set up the whole flight. And um, that helps uh, create a lot of overlap between the images. And in doing so, it uh, allows the computer and the software to stitch them together much more effectively because uh, the uh, drone knows its GPS location and that uh, gets embedded into the image file and that uh, goes a long way to put the images together. Um, here is the uh, flight pattern on Broadway. I only had to take 16 shots. I probably could have taken a few less, but uh, that that was adequate and the whole flight only took a couple of minutes. So um, when you take all these photos together, 
uh, question is, you know, so then what? And when they're all stitched together, like I was just saying, into an ortho mosaic, uh, that's just a, a big Mondo Im version of all the images stitched together. That giant image both knows where it is and uh, when it was taken, you know, when the photos were taken, and it's all uh, using the best pixels from each image together to uh, to create the nicest image uh, possible. Um, here you'll see examples of the ortho images from uh, those two street murals. Uh, and, you know, this is infrastructure. I work for Dottie, so uh, this is our roadway infrastructure. The one on the right, the Black Lives Matter mural, had cars driving over it like two days later. So there was like a day or two of breathing room to to capture this and to to record both the event and just uh, what we have on the ground and so forth. And uh, now these images can be used within maps to uh, to to make them much more useful in different settings and by different departments, etc. And the city has a great GIS, uh, you know, uh, enterprise infrastructure, so um, that that makes it all the easier. Uh, I'm going to pass it off now to Joe and I'm going to let him uh, introduce himself a bit and tell you a little bit about his work down at Civic Center Park and um, and what he did. Joe. All right. Thank you, Jim. Um, can you guys hear me OK? Yep. All right, cool. I had problems earlier. Sorry. Um, so yeah, my name is Joe Mirabli. I work with the Denver Parks Department, the Water Conservation Division. And uh, one of the perks of my job lately has been flying the drone for parks. Um, so I guess the question here in this forum is what can drones do for infrastructure? Well, they allow for inspections of facilities in large areas with fewer staff and from a much safer environment, like at home on your computer. Um, they uh, allow for point in time image captures, which could be before, during, or after a certain event, such as the closure, revitalization, or reopening of Civic Center Park. Um, and with that, you can also track the change and the change detection between those points when you do fly and compile these images. Next slide. All right. All right, so before I get into the inspection part further, I kind of want to go briefly over the flight planning. Um, there are a variety of flight planning software out there available. Um, the examples I'm going to go over are from one called Drone Deploy, um, which I thoroughly enjoyed in the city utilized. Um, it's kind of in limbo, but I can still use it, so I'm still using it. Um, they basically all have their uh, different specialties, but they do kind of the same thing, which is the flight planning. The uh, picture here, the green grid, is uh, what they call a crosshatch pattern, and it basically just flies and takes nadir pictures, which is from the drone straight down to the earth. Um, and because it has a slightly fish-eyed lens, you can get some uh, facade details as you're flying. But the other flight option is uh, like an orbital flight, which does an oblique shot, which is basically any other angle, in this case, 45 degrees. So you can get really great facade um, details that way. Um, you can... Uh, plan your flights ahead of time or on site using mobile devices and apps. Um, you can also apply for airspace approval directly from the FAA in near real time from most flight planning apps. To kind of go into the airspace approval, again, some apps allow the pilot to not only check airspace in real time, but also request permission to fly in controlled airspace directly from air traffic professionals like at uh, DEN or Centennial Airport, anything like that. Um, in this case, there were no advisories or controlled airspaces, but you can see on there different uh, notable things like uh, police or hospital helipads, things to look out for. Um, but in doing this, it also coordinates all the different air traffic, making the airspace you know, much safer for everyone involved because you know, one of the first rules or main rules of flying a drone is you yield to any manned operations. So this helps you know if you're more or less likely to encounter manned operations. And then I'll move on to inspections. Um, so this example of inspection shows a hard to measure roof area on the McNichols building. 
um, some turf damage across the uh, big path there from the McNichols building, which it also gives you, um, maybe not on this one, on the next one, uh, a measurement of the whole thing. And if way in the back there, yeah, okay, there you go. You can see a little better the yellow kind of warning triangle. It's hard to see on this frame, but there's a what looks like a drainage issue. And I imagine I've been on top of the uh, Greek amphitheater before, and it's kind of hard to get onto and and see. So this is a good way to see that and detect issues that are hard to get to. Um, and you can, within the software, view them from a multitude of angles. You can also click on whichever image or images were compiled to make that ortho mosaic. And you can zoom in and inspect because the resolution is pretty high on these. I think 400 megapixels, something like that. Um, so the actual reporting process to make it easier because not everyone's a drone software expert. Um, it compiles the reports into these nice concise um, images that, you know, list the issues or the areas and then break it down into briefly what they are, or in this case, like the roof area measurements, um, or the turf damage area, if you had to estimate how to, or how much turf you needed to repair there, or, you know, if you want to send someone up to double check what was going on on the Greek amphitheater, you know, it makes it easier. Um, so easy, in fact, it's a, uh, it's as easy as opening or printing a PDF and sending it on to other work groups who will actually perform the work and put eyes on these things and give you a report back. Um, next slide. All right, so the comparisons over time. This kind of goes back to the first one of the first things I talked about, the uh, time changes. Um, it's kind of cool to me because it allows subtle changes through the year to become drastic and sometimes stunning historic records as your image library grows. Um, I didn't want to get away from Civic Center, but I have other areas where I have flown turf areas for several months through a year, and you can see through those months how things have changed. Um, then this next slide is kind of a funny thing on hard to reach places uh you can see the the top portion of the civic center building um, and in the corner we noticed a gatorade bottle um in a really hard to get to place so we've identified the uh i guess i don't know presence of but not who is the 2021 bottle flip champion in the city and county of denver but there's the proof. And uh, I guess that's all I got on my end. So thank you for bearing with me. All right, I've got a, a couple more slides to, to, to go. Um, I'm going to move on. Uh, thanks, Joe. Uh, yeah, inspections are, are no small thing. And that's one of the big uh, takeaways today is um, we can take pretty pictures, but we can also find out super valuable information and keep people safe. Um, turns out that if you uh, take enough pictures of something, the software will uh, pretty much build it for you in 3D. Right here, you're looking at the city and county building, uh, that horseshoe shape in front of the city and county building. And uh, all those green dots or the red dots on the left are photos, uh, camera positions. And that's about 1,300 of them, a little more than that. And uh, the software pretty quickly will create uh, a point cloud from those and a point cloud is just what it sounds like it's a, a a whole cloud of points every point has a location and a color which creates a big just a big cloud and then uh, it creates a 3d textured mesh which kind of creates surfaces and glues them all together if you will and that's a lot nicer to look at it's a little more heavy to browse around in but uh, it's nice to look at and then uh, one of the last things I'll talk about is uh, once you have uh, something built in a 3D environment like that, the software will let you uh, fly through and sort of uh, take the cameras you see here on the screen. I'm uh, sort of created a path with uh, showing where the camera 
uh, the, a photo, uh, a, a flight path will go to and what the camera angle is at that point in the flight path. So it will do everything for you. And this is not, not really flying a drone at this point. You already flew the drone, but now you're kind of flying through the 3D model that's been made. And um, like this uh, example here, um, I, I just made it one day uh, from the 3D model and shows the city and county building, but all of this is recreated in 3D. Uh, we're not literally looking at any photos at the moment, but if you see something it, that you wanted to look more closely at, uh, now this is a hard way to do an inspection because you already built the 3D model, but uh, if you do see something uh, in the software, you can simply click right there and look at an actual photograph of that uh, location on the building. Uh, it might be a Gatorade bottle. It might be uh, some electrical equipment that the Christmas lights need to be plugged into or any number of things. But that's an example of, uh, you know, how you can create a fly through uh, real easily uh, in software. And I won't go into this, but we uh, those uh, imagery layers that I mentioned are now they're on a map there. I put them on a map pretty much immediately. And this map here, uh, I said, shows three image, imagery layers, but there's really four because the one on the bottom, which uh, where you can see all the grass is brown and sort of dead looking, that's your stock imagery from online. And then there's the the, uh, the Bannock Street mural. There's Joe's uh, uh, imagery of the uh, of the park. And then on the right is the Black Lives Matter street mural uh, imagery layer as well. So uh, put them all together, uh, built, built a map, build a web app around that. I put some bookmarks on it, as you can see there, and you can navigate around the map real easily. And um, 3D panoramas are also an, a real uh, popular takeaway from uh, using a drone. You park that drone in one spot and it has an automated recipe that it goes through. It captures lots of images and uh, I won't pan through this right now, but you can move it around and zoom in and out and look every place that could be seen from that location up in the air on that day. And uh, so I want to say thanks. And uh, I'm Jim Casey, uh, Joe Maribel, uh, thanks for presenting with me. And uh, this is a good example of how departments can work together uh, after they figure out they're kind of doing the same thing. Uh, take any questions if you have them. Hey, thanks a lot guys, that was really cool. Uh, hey, Jim, first off, um, there's someone in the chat would like to have your um, contact information. So if you wouldn't mind dropping your, um, or I can do that as well. We'll drop your, your email into there. Um, and it looks like Joe already asked, or answered one of the questions. What software did you use to create the flight plans? Um, Joe responded that that's on a dr uh, drone deploy. Um, and then another question, uh, does the hardware and software stitch these together? Uh, Joe replied that the software does that. Uh, how about, what is the output file format from some of these? Uh, I'll, I'll take that. Uh, there's a number of different varieties of output. Uh, the, the, the ortho mosaic that you saw is a, a TIFF image file. So that's one version of output. I created a video file of that fly through. And so it really, uh, the point cloud is a whole different flavor of output. So uh, it really depends on what you're after. Um, hope not to evade the question. <laughs> There's a lot of outputs available. Sure. And that and that point cloud, I know those come in different. That, that's, so there's another question is, does the drone output a point cloud model um, and of what type of file format? Is that, does that use, the, like, I know Esri has a. Like an LAS. Yeah, like an LAS. That's standard. Yeah, so LA, okay, cool. So an LAS is the output from that. Nice. Do you, when you when you do the flight planning, do you just program in where you want it to go and does it fly itself or do you are you on the joysticks actually uh, flying it around? Um, the answer is yes. In the case of uh, like Joe there, uh, excuse me, Joe, if I'm stealing your thunder, Joe did that 250 odd images uh, over the park area and that was all pre-programmed at like 200 feet. Now, when I was flying in front of the city and county building, there was no room for error. Uh, so I did all of that manually. So basically, if it's top down, program it if you can. And if it require, if there's a tree involved, do it manually.
Oh, cool. So if I could uh, if I could jump on that really quick too. Um, while it is an automated flight plan, you are in control the whole time. So if like one time I was flying at Wash Park and a medical helicopter came zipping across the park kind of low, I just kind of stopped my mission, paused it, lowered the drone. Once the helicopter passed, it just resumed, and that was that. Cool. So I'm I'm still gonna have to learn how to actually fly it if I want to do this. I can't just tell it what to do and it'll go do it for me. Right. <laughs> You're still in control. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Good to know. Uh, thanks, guys. Let's see. Let's see. Um, oh, here, we got a couple more questions come in. Um, uh, also, does the drone calculate the geographic coordinates so that you can stitch tiles together? The drone knows where it was at the point where every picture was taken. So every picture has the coordinates stamped into that image. Yep, okay, cool. Uh, what's your recommendation on learning to fly a drone? Any particular schools or trainings that you recommend? Definitely do a training if you can pull it off. And I don't have a particular one uh, to recommend. I did mine a couple a couple years ago. I'd probably forget their, say their name wrong if I tried. Joe? Yeah, mine was also a couple years ago, and it was through a, it was like a side branch of a construction company. Come to find out, and I can't remember who they were at the time, but I agree. If you're going to try and get the license, do take a training course because there's a lot of information, flight patterns, airports, airspaces, weather, no TAMs, all kinds of acronyms and fun stuff to learn. Yeah, I mean, I imagine this is a rapidly growing field. I'm sure there's there's probably lots of options out there these days for for training and opportunities to learn. Um, what other apps or software do you use with the drones for flying, image processing, etc.? The list is long. Uh, Joe? Um, well, I like I mentioned before, I use drone deploy a lot on this one. Um, the DJI Go 4 app that you know you need to basically start flying any drones has some neat flight features. They all kind of have their own thing they focus on. Um, we've also used Pix4D for uh, processing, which puts a lot of a lot of the power processing power and output power into your hands. Where drone deploy would kind of do a lot of the stuff behind the scenes for you. It was almost like having an extra team on retainer, whereas you know some of the other stuff you do a lot of the head work on your own. Um, I know you, Jim, were mentioning Litchi. I think you know about, more about that one than I do. Yeah, Litchi, Litchi is a cool app for uh, uh, pre-programmed flights, uh, and there's one I use for uh, uh, for uh, flights where it's pointing the map imagery flights, I, and it's called Map Pilot. I, I really like that app a lot, or Map Pilot Pro, I guess it is now, and. Um, yeah, and before I forget, there's just one thing, and sorry to tack on, but you know, I did use GPS, uh, GPS device, and uh, some control points on the ground to process the imagery more accurately. But most of it, most of it was within like one meter of where I wanted it anyway. But that really tightened it a little bit, and I forgot to make that point earlier. Excuse me. Cool. Yeah, always, always doing ground truthing with with all the with most aerial imagery capturing. That and it do. is stay after all. I had to mention a GPS. At some yeah. Point. <laughs> um, so I think the final question, and I think does one does the do, does the software generally come with the drone? Is it a package that you buy, or or is the software and the drone kind of separate, and you can use um, different softwares with different drones? And then also, what is what does the kind of post processing work look like um, once you've captured all of it, and and how does that feed into the software? Um, I'll, t I'll take that. Or Joe, do you have any? Um, I guess the, uh, the processing part kind of boils down to what software you are using. Um, some of it's more hands-on, some of it's more just put your pictures in this folder on the web and let that company deal with it. Um, but from there, once they process it, it's really the processing of the images that get, then gives you the power to turn it into like a point cloud or a geotiff or that kind of thing for other applications. Um, most drones uh, companies come with like their own, 
like standard flight software that isn't as advanced or has as many uh, pre-programmed flight options. Um, but there's there's plenty, a lot of the flight software out there is free, but if you want more features like uh, doing panoramas, which are kind of hard to show on this presentation, then you have to like kind of go up a tier, kind of like anything these days, any mobile game or app, the more features you want, the higher tier you want, the more you got to kind of pay to unlock, if you will. Uh, and I would I would say keep the hardware and the software separate, and that way neither one of them outpaces the other one. And there's lots of both coming out all the time. Sure. Yeah, I like that. I think that's some good advice. All right, we are kind of running over time, so I let's. Um, Bruce, do you got a final question for us? Oh uh, yeah. I do have a final question. Don't answer it. Um, <laughs> what is the name of the building in the fly-through video? First correct answer wins. And there's one more question that's just come in. Uh, I think that's more, oh, more of a comment. Yeah. Yeah. So it looks like there's um, uh, someone is enrolled in part 107 training with Remote Pilot 101. Um, I think that's probably the name of the program, Remote Pilot 101. Uh, easy to follow and reasonably priced. Cool. Thanks for the info. All right. As we wrap up the final question, I want to thank everyone for all of our participants and our presenters. Um, really, really another great uh, GIS Day event today. Some, I think some of the some of the best presentations I think we've ever seen, and I, I probably say that every year. But um, these were really great. Um, always difficult when we're trying to do this remotely. So uh, thank you for everyone that joined the presentation or joined the um, event. Um, really happy to see everyone here and the, such strong uh, interest in GIS. So thank everyone, and see you next year, hopefully in person. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.